So the past couple of weeks, we've been thinking, or at least I've been speaking, don't know if you've been thinking, but I've been speaking about God's unexpected, God's unexpected leading. And he leads his people, as we see in the Bible, to places and situations where his people, including us, would not even dream of going. Don't want to go there. Don't want that to happen. But God is in it. And we see that all the way through the Bible. And he does amazing things. Like he, he leads his people to the Red Sea, as I said last week, with the Egyptian army bearing down them. They think they're all going to die. But then he does something amazing. He parts the waters. They weren't expecting that because he's the God of the unexpected. But then he takes his people to the, the bitter waters of disappointment at Mara. And when we're in the depths of disappointment, it's very hard to believe that God is with us because all we see is the disappointment. It's very hard to believe that God is somehow working his perfect purposes because of the disappointment. Sometimes hard to believe that, isn't it? But he is, and we see it through the pages of scripture that God knows exactly what is happening and he knows exactly why he is allowing it to happen. If he didn't know, he wouldn't be God. He knows. He knows what, he, what he's doing. He knows what's going on. And as we discovered in Exodus, at the bitter pool of Mara, God has things he wants to teach us about ourselves and <laughs> things he wants to teach us about himself. But God never, ever seems to do things the way that we would choose to have them done. Do, is that true? Often, that often seems true to me. For example, it was always God's will to lead his people out of Egypt into the promised land of Canaan. It was always his will to, to do that, yet... What could have been a journey of a matter of days from Egypt to Canaan, it took them 40 years. And God led them every step of the way. They experienced all kinds of hardships and miraculous provision, disappointments, but surprises. And God knew and planned it all for his purposes. And you often, maybe you've asked the question, or you've heard someone ask the question, when I became a Christian, why, why doesn't God just take me to heaven there and then? Why do I have to go through life <laughs> with all the hardship and, and, and hard times that come? Why, I'm, I'm God's, why, why can't you just take me to the promised land of, the, just take me to heaven now, Jesus. Take me now, because this is too hard. Well, God knows God has planned and purposed our life it, for, for things that, that maybe we can't even imagine. It, in Ephesians 2, our life is described as a poem. You know, it says, we are God's workmanship. In Ephesians 2, verse 10, I think that is. Uh, the word workmanship is poema in Greek, poem. He's written your life, as, and he doesn't make he doesn't make mistakes. Every page is perfect. We may say, well, that page, I'm going to tear that page out of my life because I don't like it. I'm rejecting that. That cannot possibly be of God. But God doesn't make mistakes. The beautiful story of your life, every page, when you get right to the end, you'll be able to flick through it, as it were, and see that it all ties together you'll be able to see what God has been doing through the pages of your life. And I've said this before a few times, and I'm, I'm not apologizing for saying it again. It's been, it's been said that the, the, the most perhaps common word you'll hear in heaven when you get there is, oh, oh, now I get it. Now I understand what God was doing in that. And yes, it was horrible and I would never have chosen it, but the, through it, God has done something amazing. And now I understand why. He's all powerful and he knows what he's doing. And we're very familiar with the verses in Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, sorry, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
as the heavens are higher than the earth, infinitely higher, infinitely grander, infinitely different and better than our ways and our thoughts are God's ways and God's thoughts. And God leads and moves and does unexpected things. But what I'd like us to think about for a while now, maybe for the next few weeks, is not only does he lead in unexpected ways, but he also chooses unexpected people to accomplish his purposes. God chooses unexpected people for his purposes. So who does God choose? What kind of people does God choose to work with? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, he says, But he said to me, but God said to me, writes Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so my first point this morning is, who does God choose? God chooses the weak to accomplish his purposes. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this is what Jesus said to Paul when Paul asked him three times for his thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, to be removed. Three times Paul asked him and Jesus didn't remove his thorn, but instead he said, my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul wanted it gone, but Jesus knew better. Paul described his thorn in the flesh as a messenger from Satan. And we may well think, how on earth could God allow that to be there? How on earth could God allow a messenger from Satan to be in, in Paul's life in that way? But Jesus didn't just allow it. He purposed it. And the reason is that the power of God would be made perfect through the weakness of Paul that this thorn in the flesh was producing. Jesus said it himself. My power is made perfect in weakness. And that is the reason why I'm not going to remove this messenger from Satan from your life. That's challenging, isn't it? But God chooses to use weak people and he allows and purposes weakness in our lives that he would use us and that his glory would be shown more than if we weren't weak but then it gets worse or better depending on which way we're looking at this Paul goes on to say something incredible in verse 10 of um where, where are we 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10 he says this for the sake of Christ then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. He's saying that he's content with all these things. And content is an interesting word to use. He isn't saying, I'm enduring hardship and persecutions for a while, but praying they will stop so I can have an easier life. He's saying he's content with these things. And this is not normal, <laughs> is it? And so what I did is I thought, this is not normal. So I looked up the word content in, the, in New Testament Greek. And, and I'm sorry, but it gets worse. <laughs> because the original Greek word for content is, if I can say it right, eudokeo, which doesn't mean content as we know it. It actually means it seems good to me, or it's one's good pleasure, or to be well pleased with, or take pleasure in. And God actually uses this exact word, eudokeia, at the baptism of Jesus in Luke 3.22. And the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Not just I am content. Let's use, use stronger language. But it's the same Greek word. I am well pleased. God was well pleased. Eudokeia. And so Paul 
felt the same about his weaknesses, his insults, his hardships, his persecutions, his calamities. He felt the same about those things as the father feels about Jesus. Let's just let that sink in. It's exactly the same word. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. This is my hardship, says Paul. This is my calamity. With it, I am well pleased. And it sounds crazy. But this is exactly what Paul is saying. Is he crazy? Paul, he might have been a bit, you know, he was crazy for Jesus. But he wasn't crazy, and he'd learned a lesson, a secret, and the secret is this, uh, and this is my second point, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Our weakness makes way for God's strength to be shown. The reason why Paul was so successful The reason why he planted so many churches, saw so many converts, was used by God in so many incredible supernatural ways is because he knew the secret of strength through weakness. Paul's weakness made way for the strength of God to be displayed. And that's why he was well pleased with it. Uh, And now... None of us are Paul. None of us are like Paul, which is probably a good thing. None of us have been through the hardships and persecutions that Paul went through. And none of us have been used by God like Paul was in such powerful and dramatic ways. Paul was raised up by God for a very special and unique purpose in history. But the principle remains that when we are weak... It makes way for the strength of God to be shown. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in in the first, his first letter to them in chapter one, verse 27 to 29, that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. See, God is different from us. He does things and chooses things that we wouldn't do or choose. If we were going to build a church, we wouldn't choose foolish people We wouldn't choose weak people. We would go out and choose the most wise and clever and strongest and most impressive looking people we could find. But God doesn't do that. Think about who Jesus called to follow him. He called uneducated fishermen who were looked down on in their society. He chose tax collectors who cheated money, cheated people out of money. He chose them to be his disciples. There is no way we would choose those kinds of people. Absolutely no chance. And that gives us hope. What gives me hope? Because if you were born again, It means Jesus has chosen you to follow him. And he hasn't chosen you because of what the world thinks of you. Because God's thoughts are not our thoughts. They are infinitely higher. God's ways are not our ways. They're infinitely higher. And God does not think like we think. He views strength and weakness in an entirely different way from us. And we see, we see this truth presented to us in no clearer way than in the cross of Christ. Paul writes, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly or foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
Or said in a different way, the foolishness of God is wiser than men's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than men's strength. And God's foolishness and God's weakness can be summed up in just two words. Christ crucified. The crucifixion of Jesus is God's foolishness and God's weakness, yet it's wiser and stronger than anything else in the world. Because the cross is the ultimate symbol of weakness. It's the ultimate symbol of defeat and shame. But at the same time, it's the key to victory. It's the key to wisdom. It's the key to power. The Pentecostal theologian Gordon writes this. It's hard for those in the Christianized West in which we live, where the cross for almost 19 centuries has been the primary symbol of the faith. It's hard for us to appreciate how utterly mad the message of a God who got himself crucified by his enemies must have seemed to the first century Greek or Roman. But it is precisely the depth of this scandal and folly that we must appreciate if we are to understand both why the Corinthians were moving away from it towards wisdom and why it was well over a century before the cross appears among Christians as a symbol of their faith. To them, in the first century, utterly mad. That phrase, it must seem utterly mad. This message of a God who got himself crucified by his enemies. Ridiculous. F more than foolish. And so the cross of Christ is our ultimate example of God's strength being produced out of human weakness. Nobody has ever been brought lower than Christ went, and he went there willingly. And nobody will ever be as strong or as high as Christ is. But in Jesus, today, we, in our weakness, have, a un have an unlimited source of strength. He wants to not only fill us with his strength, but to show his strength through us. And God doesn't view our weakness, our hardships, our calamities as being hindrances to what he wants to do. Rather, it is through these exact things that God has chosen that his strength, that his wisdom, that his will, that his power would be displayed. We've sung it once and perhaps we'll sing it again in a few moments. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Now Paul, to finish, in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he said, he didn't just say, I am well pleased or I'm content I'm well pleased with weaknesses insults hardships persecutions and calamities he added two, three, four, five, five very important words before he said that he said for the sake of Christ for the sake of Christ for the sake of of him carrying out his perfect will in me for my transformation, for the sake of him carrying out his perfect will through me to touch other people in ways that I couldn't do in my own so-called strength and wisdom. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. Weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Let's be still again. And let's allow the God of strength 
through his Holy Spirit to touch our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the God of comfort. He's the one who comes alongside us to bring us comfort, to bring us peace, to bring us strength in the midst of what we're going through. You may find it easy to identify your weaknesses, hardships, calamities. Let's surrender these things to God right now. Surrender them to him. And as we do so, we're saying, these are yours, God. You've allowed them to be in my life, but I'm asking you that you would show your strength through these circumstances. Show your mighty hand. Do miracles because of what I'm going through. And in my weakness, God, I surrender to you. Every part of me. Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for the cross. That place in the world's eyes of, of foolishness, of weakness. But by your knowledge and your wisdom, the place of the highest wisdom and the strongest strength. And so, Jesus, we kneel before your cross now. And we worship you. We worship you for your, your wisdom, your knowledge, your insight. We worship you for your power. And your ability to transform the worst of situations. Into good. Into your good. We worship you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, would you come and touch us now? As we wait on you, would you renew us in our inner man? Would you pour strength into us as we wait in your presence? Strengthen us, Jesus, with your strength. Thank you, Lord.